Okay, Owen, so it's uh, 2 p.m. here in Taliete and uh, everything ready for your presentation. You can start, please introduce yourself and the room is yours. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting me to speak to you all today. Uh, so my name is Owen Carlos and um, in, my, uh, in my day job, I work for Red Bull Powertrains in Formula One, but uh, the reason I think I've been invited long to talk to you today is because I'm also one of the chief design judges at Formula Student in Germany. Uh, the presentation I'm going to give first uh, is, as you can see here, called Resources and Requirements in Formula Student. Um, the intention here is to have a wide angle view of the project, so I'm not going to focus on any specific technology, but rather look at how the project works uh, as a whole and how different teams approach it. I'm going to start off by giving you a little, little introduction to who I am and, and some of my background and how I've been involved in Formula Student for, for many years. And then I'm going to move on to talk about how you set targets for your Formula Student team, your vehicle, and the whole project. And we're going to touch on um, perhaps some of the dangers here of what happens when you set targets and you ignore them, or maybe you don't set targets in the first place. We're also going to talk about how we turn a target into a functional requirement. And at this point, we're going to talk about simulation and how we transform ideas and concepts into mathematics and engineering and the language of science. Having decided what the functional requirements of, of our project and of our car need to be, I'd then like to move on to talk about how we allocate resources to that. That covers budgets, that covers planning, and how we plan to succeed uh, with, with, our, with our target. Um, when we talk about budgeting, that's not just financial, but that's also human. So it's in, we're going to touch on the human side of the project at that point as well. Once we've got um, the resources lined up, we have our function requirements, we know how we're going to achieve our targets, and it's important to talk about how we manage the build of the car and how we execute that project. So I'd like to, some co topics I'd like to cover there. And then finally, once there is a completed vehicle, uh, it's important to talk about validation, not just of the whole vehicle, but of the subsystems of the vehicle and maybe as well uh, individual components. Okay, so by way of introduction, um, this is my former student car. Uh, I did former student in 2006. Uh, back then, the former student event in Germany, for example, didn't even exist. Um, we had a clear aim for our car, so we wanted it to be lightweight, powerful engine. I think that's perhaps no big surprise to anybody that's done a former student car before. Um, we paid almost no attention to aerodynamics. I think if you look at a lot of cars in former student competitions around the world, um, aerodynamics is, is a big factor, but but for us back then, there was almost nothing. We wanted to be able to construct as much of the car uh, as we could ourselves uh, for a number of reasons. So we ended up with a tubular frame construction. We used 10 inch wheel rims and we had a four cylinder engine because that was what our team understood and, and knew about uh, within the university. One of the key things that, that I think helped us as students and, and something that I, I think um, had an event like this existed, we'd have certainly used the opportunity to, um, was we talked to design judges and we talked to other students about our designs before we actually built the car. So um, we went to the former student competition in 2005, so the year before that we built our car. Um, we, we spoke to the design judges, we spoke to other teams, we, we tried to understand where the car we had designed would fit into the rest of the competition and how well we thought it would it would do. So um, was it a success or a failure? Well, I thought it was a success, uh, but 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 maybe we didn't get all the points that we should have in design. Um, when when it came down to it, we set ourselves a weight target. We, we were almost 40 kilos over that, which was about 20%. Um, which is, is tough really, like that we missed that target by a long way. So that clearly was, wasn't great. Um, it led to issues of tire wear and the endurance. So we, the car was progressively more difficult to drive through the endurance event. Um, and there was a certain amount of parasitic mass on the car as well. And, and some details which we hadn't really fully planned out when we designed the car um, weren't done in a very efficient way. Uh, there was some suspension misalignment construction issues as well that we didn't really realize until until we'd left the university and we finally checked. I think the uh, roll center probably was not on the center line of the car because the suspension was asymmetric left and right hand side by, by some amount, um, which certainly wasn't a planned design. Um, and we weren't really prepared for the static events as well. So the business presentation, we had some good feedback from the judges, but we went on on far too long. 
Having said that, on the plus side, um, we did manage to extract 90 horsepower out of the engine, which was one of our targets. Um, we were the first car from our university to complete every event, first time out. So we, we completed the endurance, uh, although you know, we, we were hard on the tires, but we did complete it. And that was something that we had decided very early on was one of our key, our key parameters and our key metrics for success. Um, and we were completed early enough to run two weeks of testing, which again was, was, was kind of one of our targets. So anyway, that's a bit about my, my background, but um, let's move on and talk about target setting and how we set targets for, for our former student car. Um, there's a whole lot of different ways that teams approach former student, um, and we're going to touch on some of those this morning, uh, this afternoon for you. Um, but it's certainly true to say that if the whole team has the same aim, the project is going to be easier. That's not to say that you can't, everybody in the team can't have different ideas, but clearly, uh, if everybody has the same overall goal, then, then that does help. And that's true of any team. That's not just former student or even just motorsport. That's true of any team, I think. Um, it's important to be realistic about your team's limitations as well. Look at what expertise is in the team and what interest is in the team and try and play to that. If you've got somebody that's really interested in doing a tubular steel chassis, then having them work on a composite monocoque, even though they might be capable of doing that, if they're not interested, it's going to be more challenging to get them to work really hard uh, at times when, when the project is challenging. Along those lines, keeping that team together, keeping your former student team together and motivated can be tricky. Um, I've got something I call the rule of seven. So it doesn't matter really how big the former student team is. There's generally seven people that are working as a core on this team and others dip in and out. Sometimes the seven changes slightly as you go through different phases, but very often you see there's a core of, of about seven individuals. Um, and you certainly see that even in some of the larger teams uh, from 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 around Europe, you see they've got a, I don't know, maybe 40 individuals at the competitions. But when there's a problem with the car or there's some unreliability, then it's normally a core of seven there helping out and, and making it go, go correctly. Something that maybe is easy to overlook, depending on how the university you're working uh, at structures the course, is it's important to include some academics, academic study as part of the program aim. So you're doing former student because it's interesting and because it gives you a, a wide background and a different background than, than most students. Um, but it's important to have some kind of academic study as part of the, of the, uh, of the program. So I think it's probably fair to say that most former student teams lie inside of a triangular diagram and each point of the diagram is one extreme of the competition, uh, uh, which I'm calling design, build or race. So a good example of a team that's really focused on the design uh, was a Japanese university that I saw at former student um, maybe 10 years ago now. It was a car made entirely from aluminium and it was designed pretty much by one person they were halfway through the competition so some of the dynamic events had started and the car clearly wasn't finished and in fact it wasn't just not finished it was not finished by about two months there was no way it was ever going to be complete and the team of three people couldn't care less for them it wasn't really a consideration that the, that the car wasn't finished that they hadn't actually finished fabrication for them it was all about realizing this amazing design they had Everything was beautifully artisan made. You couldn't fault any of the manufacturing. It just wasn't finished. But for them, it, they didn't care. They just wanted to design a car. The next point on the triangle is, is build. So this is teams which are really focused on building a car. That's all they're interested in. They've got to build a car. And they've got kind of a clear focus on uh, what subsystems they need in order to produce a car, but they don't spend much time thinking about how the whole thing should come together, should it be designed properly, and what they do with it when it's finished. Uh, some of the UK universities that I've judged over the years uh, fall into this category. There's no real consistent engineering design in what they, they're trying to do, um, but they're very clear on day one, you're going to do brakes, you're going to do suspension, you're going to do chassis, and they decide that without really thinking about the overall project. The last group uh, of, of teams is uh, is focused on the racing side of things. So um, yes, they have to have some aspects of design and build, but really for them, they're focused entirely on the competitive side and the dynamic side of the competition. So um, 
if they have a good design in previous years, they're not they're not afraid just to rebuild the same thing or improve it slowly, uh, evolve that design because for them, lots of testing, lots of racing is really important. And at that point, they're happy to sacrifice performance in the static events. We've had teams in the past, for example, that have not come to design finals in FS Germany because they're so focused on on getting a better score in the in the autocross so i think every team probably falls within within this diagram um there are one or two that are very much on one of the edges but every team's on there somewhere i think so clearly uh time is is a really key resource here in, in formula students so um there's only um there's only so much time to complete the project and the project will start irrespective of whether you're ready or not uh, Finance and engineering clearly are linked to time um, and efficiency is, ba is therefore essential in every aspect of the program. Um, look at the picture here, you know, if, if you didn't have to do the course, then you wouldn't spend your time slaloming through the cones, you would go straight down one side. Um, so if you can do that and get away with it, then that's the fastest way to, to, uh, to um, achieve your goal. And it's important to set targets to help define what that path is. By the same token, it's important not to waste any resources. So uh, you've got this finite time. Um, completing things twice is probably one of the worst mistakes you could do. However, I will qualify that, it might actually still be worth doing that. So, so, so it's certainly worth being, being aware of that, um, but it could be one of the worst things that you do. One of the things to think about as well, and something that I ask teams, uh, former student all the time is, if you were given a bigger budget, what would you do with it? And that's something that not many teams have thought about. Um, one of one of I guess every design every design judge has their their pet hates. One of mine really is teams that say to us, "I didn't have enough money." You shouldn't really try and design a car which doesn't have um, doesn't have you don't have the, the resources to produce. When you're setting the overall aims of the project. It's difficult to do, but I think it's very important to try and focus on why you're setting your target. It's important to focus on why, because it helps you to be self-critical, helps improve efficiency by validating your targets and aims. It's gonna help you at design judging as well. So the design judges are gonna come to you and say, why is your car like it is? Why is it not like the team next to you? What is it about your car which makes it the best? Why have you designed it? If you're focusing on what or how you do something, it's going to restrict your creativity. Um, and it can come later on in the process. If you understand why you're doing something, then you can understand how to get there or what you need to design later on. Um, and it's the former student competition is not necessarily to, to design people who are good at designing racing cars, but it's a motorsport competition because relative performance is important. And if you're going to succeed, then you're going to have to do a more intelligent job than the teams that you're competing against. Um, so yeah, focus really on, on why it is you should be designing the car that, like it is. Okay, let's move on now and talk about functional requirements. So um, having decided what your team is trying to achieve, having found something which everybody is interested in, how do you turn that then into a functional requirement for, for a vehicle? So it's initially important to focus on the overall vehicle and try and uh quantify what parameter is important to achieve your targets but by that what i mean is if your target is something like the top five positions in the autocross event understand what it is that the car needs to be able to do to achieve that how fast are cars around the autocross track for example at former student germany likewise if you want to be the top three team in the skid pad event what does that equate to in terms of seconds? Well, how much lateral G do you have to pull? Try and try and pull through the information in previous years to understand what performance your car would need to have in order to achieve those targets. Once you've understood, for example, on the autocross track, what your lap time needs to be, try and break down that further to understand uh, the different parts of achieving that target time. So if it's 71 second lap, how much of those 71 seconds are spent braking? How much is spent cornering? How much is spent accelerating? And try and move away from descriptive language. So don't say the car needs to be fast or have 
good breaks or a, a corner very hard. Talk about mathematics. You need to accelerate to naught to 60 in a certain time. You need to break from 60 kilometers an hour to 40 kilometers an hour in a certain time. You need to be able to do so many Gs of cornering. You need to be able to change direction at a certain time. Try and work in mathematics because at that point you can start to use it to design the car. <clears throat> so I'm, I, I think that uh, in the very early days when I was doing Formula Student, whole vehicle simulation maybe wasn't as widespread as it is now. And certainly I hope that, that as modern Formula Student teams, you've got a, a better handle on, on lap time modeling. Um, and it can be a really powerful way of looking at the performance of your car. Um, it's also though worth being aware of the simulation limitations and any biases that are in the simulation. I mean, clearly that's true of all simulation, but, but particularly in some of the whole vehicle simulation. Um, if you have defined a track uh, for the, or a circuit for your vehicle based on previous data, um, it's almost like if you're not careful, a fixed path model where it doesn't really matter um, how big the car is or how, how, how high performance the car is, it always does the same circuit. Uh, and that can be a limitation, particularly on a former student type track where the width of the car and the width of the track are very close to each other. So what I mean here is, um, if you imagine the example we talked about just a few minutes ago with the skid pad, if you make the car narrower, the radius of the turn is increased as so you can go through it faster. If you're doing a fixed path model or you had a really wide car, then the number of lines that the car could take are, are reduced. The extreme, ang extreme position here is, if the car was the same width as the circuit, you have one racing line. You have no ability to change where you drive. You have to just do one line. Um, think as well about other things that maybe uh, are difficult to simulate. So uh, tire modeling, for example, how representative is the model of the tire and how does that affect your simulation? And also it's worth considering how good your driver might have to be in order to achieve a certain lap time. So. Uh, you don't need to be a particularly skilled driver to make the most of a powerful engine in a straight line. You just put your foot to the floor. But if the car is really uh, good at being balanced on the entry to a corner, then um, then you have to be a very skilled driver to be able to control that car and get the lap time out of it. And that's true of any racing car. That's not just former student. You see that in, in Formula One, of course. Um, Again, I think something that should be should be obvious, but, but it's really worth stating here is please don't trust your simulations blindly. Try and understand why a simulation, any simulation this is, but particularly whole vehicle simulation, is giving you a certain answer. Um, does it is it is it the simulation result what you expect to see, for example? Is it giving you something which makes sense to your engineering judgment, or is it throwing something that's unusual? Um, one thing that maybe as well is slightly overlooked is if you're going to do simulation, it's important to think about validating the simulation. So try to simulate something that you can validate uh, and, and vice versa. There's no point doing a simulation that you, you couldn't validate because then you, you don't know how, how, how good it was or otherwise. Not all of the inputs into your simulations are going to be constants. You're not going to know what all the inputs in uh, go into any simulation. But if you look at the sensitivity of them as variables, that can give you a bit of a clue as to how you might spend your different resources. When you're looking at things like sensitivity sweeps on things like mass or horsepower, um, be realistic with the parameters. Like it's all very well looking and saying if I had 250 horsepower from the former student engine that I'd be much faster. Well, yeah, clearly you would, but I think the chances of you achieving that are very small. So be realistic about how you achieve that. Um, and that is linked back to your team's interests and abilities and, and, and everything else. Um, it's important as well to be aware there's probably more way, more than one way of achieving a certain lap time. So using our autocross example, if you're trying to get to 71 seconds, uh, you might be able to do that by being really fast in a straight line and perhaps slightly slower through the corners, or you could have a slightly less powerful engine that gives you a but better cornering ability somehow, and that's a trade-off. So it's important to look around the circuit you're simulating and see where each car configuration is fastest. I think that's really quite important, and that helps um, that helps understand what the simulation is doing and is part of that that validation process as well. 
once you start doing some basic sweeps, the next step is to start linking some of the parameters together. So some parameters should be linked. So it's important to keep iterating and look at how they move around. And don't just take the data from a previous team's car. Think about things in, 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 in a bit more detail. Um, for example, if you had a situation where you increase the downforce a lot in your simulation, all of a sudden the car should look more sensitive to horsepower because more of your time is at full throttle because you don't have to break as much for corners. Um, another another example I've put here is if you've got a really tight chicane, that might favour a narrow track width of the car. So if the, if the chicane is very tight, a narrow car is going to be easy to drive, um, but it might allow you to take a corner without braking. So uh, the lap time could be compensated for increased weight transfer. But it's going to be a non-linear thing. At some point, you're going to make the car narrow enough to have it to, to, to be quick, but there's not much point in going um, going much, much narrower. So just think about things like that. And sometimes you have to kind of um, come back and, and rerun simulations you've already completed because you may have changed some of the input parameters. And these are then changing the conclusions from, from, from some of the previous simulations. Once you've gone away and understood your whole vehicle simulation, it's important to think about what subsystems you might need based on that simulation. So if your simulation sweeps are showing a really high sensitivity to mass, for example, and a low sensitivity to horsepower, then doing a supercharged or turbocharged force and engine is probably a poor choice. Likewise, if your simulation is saying you're spending less than 10% of the time in cornering, i.e. most of your time is spent accelerating and braking in a straight line, then maybe a full aerodynamic package to give you lots of downforce for cornering is a poor allocation of resources. At this point, you might find some contrasts as well between the desire of the team and the targets the team would like to achieve versus what the simulations are saying. So at that point, yeah, there's going to be some trade-offs. Um, but it's important as you're doing this trade-off to ask why is each subsystem important and which ones are key? So not every subsystem will be amazingly important to the overall performance of the car, but you might need it anyway. Um, but also be realistic about the abilities of the team. This is something that we kind of talked about a little bit earlier on. Um, if nobody, of you, nobody at your university has any knowledge of carbon fiber manufacturing, for example, then committing to a composite monocoque would be a bit of a brave step without working with some kind of external technical partner or, or somebody like this. Um, but yeah, it's really important to, to, to think about the subsystems at this level and understand which are important and where you put your resources. As we've already said, there's a finite resource in Formula Student. It's important to decide where you spend where you spend that resource and which subsystems are important. So it's an old saying, I think, that the car should be great in the sum of its parts. I think that's true of pretty much any vehicle. It's probably true of most systems. It's particularly true of former student cars. Um, and, and have a look at the picture here. So I've chosen this picture deliberately. This is a car, I think, from, from Norway, a former student a few years ago. And if you look at the front suspension and the driver seating position, it looks really good. Everything's pointing in the right direction. The car is going for a transient turn. Um, look at the rear right-hand wheel, the left of the picture the inclination of the tire here is all over the place. I think the theory was somehow that it was a passive rear steering car, but you can see that the camber control is very poor, and I'm sure this is a difficult car to drive. And the point I'm trying to make here is, it doesn't matter how good the front suspension is if the rear suspension is a poor design. And the opposite is also true, of course. Likewise, you could have a brilliant suspension setup, but if the driver is not comfortable in the car and able to make the most of that, then the whole car won't come together. The other former student judges kind of joked when I talked about this, and they said, well, uh, you've come up with some kind of magic Owen number for scoring. So what I used to do was rather than add the points from each individual category, I would multiply them together because this shows if there's any categories that are very low, then they score almost no points overall. Um, and certainly, the way that most competitions are judged, where you add the scores together from each individual category, if you've got one area that's really weak, you can compensate it from somewhere else, but that's not how a real car, a real vehicle, a real system of components works. Um, to try and illustrate that, I've got some examples here. So 
if you've got dry tires or you're on a wet track, it doesn't matter how much downforce, how much horsepower you've got, you won't go any faster because the tires are your limiting factor there. Going another step further, if you've got lots of aerodynamics, but you don't have enough horsepower, then it doesn't matter how much downforce you have because the car's speed will be very low still. So you can't compensate. You've got to work on everything together. Yes, understand what is important, but don't forget areas that because at some point you're going to drag the performance of the whole the whole vehicle down. OK, so having decided some targets and some functional requirements, let's think about allocation of resources. How do we make sure that having identified the which subsystems are important, we then can take those through and execute those properly? So the first thing to do, uh, and this is sometimes um, obvious to your team, but it's important to go through the team and identify what the strengths and weaknesses are. Uh, resources in the team, as I said at the very beginning, can be both a human resource, there can be a financial resource, but a successful team is playing to the strengths by setting appropriate functional requirements for the car, which match up with the resources and the strengths and weaknesses in the team. As I kind of hinted before, don't use the excuse we didn't have enough money. There are times, yes, when maybe the budget is, is reduced, but if you know the budget is important for your team, and it is, I'm sure, for most teams, then have some plans to mitigate if you don't have the right finance. If you know your budget is 20,000 euros and you need to go away and knowingly design a car which would take 50,000 euros to design and produce, then clearly that would be a very poor decision. So you should try as much as possible to avoid designing a car which needs more money than was available. Likewise, if your budget is 20,000 euros, maybe a car which costs 20,000 euros is a risk compared to a car which will cost 18,000 with some, with some margin. Um, if you do end up using this excuse in design judging, I can personally guarantee I will ask you the question, what you would do with more money and how would you have made your car better? And it's surprising when you ask that question, how few teams have really thought about the answer. Let's say I, for example, am a sponsor because, you know, maybe I am. And I'd like to sponsor your former student team because we've had a good conversation in design judging. What would you spend the money on? Now, some teams talk to me about spending money on dampers or tires or anything, but, but have a view of what you'd spend that money on. Because one day you never know, you might be talking to somebody who could be your next sponsor. Um, but but it's really important to have have that view. So when you start out the former student project, if you're lucky, the same number of team members will be there at the end. But how big is it now? How big is it at the beginning when you're starting out? I talked about the rule of seven at the beginning of the presentation, and you can see here again, I've deliberately chosen a picture where there are the seven team members watching their car performing. Um, it's important to remember this rule because the size of a team is, is more than just the number of the team members because some team members have different strengths, different stages of the program. And if you look at your functional requirements, you should have some kind of view for when you might need the greatest human resource. Um, so it's important not just to think about the individuals, but also how experienced and competent that team is. So that's not to say that every team member has to have a strong experience with former student activities, um, but also it's important to have some practical engineering skills, skills of working in a team um, and understanding where they are best suited through the, for the evolution of the project. Some teams are lucky because they can assess the experience and competence of new recruits and they can put them in the best positions, but perhaps not every team is able to do that. Um, if you are not able to do that, then actually putting, uh, putting, putting team members wherever you have the greatest need based on the functional requirements is clearly quite important. Um, As you're working through the project, it's important to look after the health and well-being of your fellow students. This is something which I think is probably increasingly important in, in, in our world and our society, but you've got to look after all your team and that helps you get the most out of them, but also helps make sure that you can achieve success in your project aims and your university careers. 
look out for any signs your colleagues are in trouble. So uh, when you're working and trying to get a degree, you're trying to uh, have the former student car, maybe you have parents you're trying to manage, you have relationships, you can allow your physical health perhaps to suffer, your mental health. Uh, look for clues as to when people are struggling. Are people falling asleep in lectures, for example? Are you asking too much them from the from the competition? Are there disagreements between team members? Does that give you some signs that maybe mentally they're not working at their best capacity? If you, have, I mean, it's natural to have some disagreements, but if you have big arguments between team members, think at this stage. You know, is this person's mental health suffering? Although it's quite a, a stark thing to say. Be alert to the risks of things like suicides. It's not a common thing by any stretch of imagination, but at the same time, former student has no immunity from this. It's still a tough project to do. You can still have risks of things like this. So if you keep on top of it, you work as a team, you look after each other, I think you'll be okay. But it's really important to be aware of, of what can go wrong at, at the extreme. One thing that all successful teams are doing is clear defining the times in the program, the times in the project, when all the car design activity comes to a stop. This is gonna be important because you have to focus on some academic work and you have to deal with the external pressure from your parents or your lecturers or your friends. Um, although it's great to, to do the former student project and clearly um, once you've worked in it, it's difficult to let it go. I'm I'm living proof of that. You know, I've been doing design judging ever since 2007. Um, but at the end of the day, you're still there to get a degree and to have a qualification from your university. Um, and although it's nice to have a former student car you can look back on, that's not necessarily going to help you get a job or train you for, for the rest of your life. So it's important to have a time when all work stops, everybody goes and does exams or coursework, and then you can come back later on. Let's talk about funding and money. So I've touched on this subject a little bit already, um, and, and I've re reproduced here the funding balance that, that I, my former student team had. Um, we had four main external sponsors, and we were also supported by a university. Um, Castrol is a brand of, of BP. Uh, Perkins make diesel engines. Uh, the Royal Navy, are, are, uh, I think everybody knows who they are. Uh, Santander, the large banking corporation. The first year that we had Santander as a sponsor, I think they were giving us maybe a thousand pounds, something fairly moderate. Um, and then the university would, would sort of help top things up. Internal funding from the university can be really valuable and it comes in kind of a number of different ways and different forms. So uh, clearly the university can kind of just bring money to the table. Um, they should also give you some academic knowledge. So that's not just from uh, your your studies, but also they'll have had experience at the university of how previous, team, previous teams have coped with a project. And they'll have some advice. One thing I would say, be a little bit careful about some of that advice because it's easy for uh, academic staff perhaps, and apologies if there's any listening in, it's sometimes easy for academic staff to focus on what pre previous teams have done and outdated ideas and concepts or lessons from 10 years ago. Um, be a little bit careful. Don't trust any any advice and take it all as, as uh, with a certain degree of skepticism. If you're having advice from the university, also you can check the validity of that versus your simulation results, for example. If your simulation sensitivity says that horsepower is the most important thing, but the university is telling you, no, 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 it's not, not that important at all, Try to understand why, where is this advice come from? Because your simulation tells you something differently. The university probably is also supplying some uh, other physical facilities. So if you're fortunate, you'll have computer suites, universities, laboratories for testing or for constructing uh, equipment in workshops and so on. Um, that can be really valuable. Uh, some universities are not happy or not so happy with the students working on uh, components themselves and you have to have uh, technicians to help but if you can negotiate some space and some resource in the university then it can be really good. The other sort of, of, of funding is external funding so this is coming from sponsors and partners. Um, again it comes in different forms so uh, sometimes the easiest thing for a sponsor to do is just to write a check for, for, for some money. 
Um, but generally, sponsors want to get something back from you as, as, as a team. There are some sponsors that are just benevolent and happy to support students. But for the most part, they would like something back from you as students or, or as a university. Clearly, a certain number of sponsors, like in our case, Santander, were focused on recruitment of graduate engineers and graduates at the university. And they saw former student as a way to access capable future employees. For some sponsors, it's much easier for them to supply their own products rather than finance, because that has a smaller impact on their core business. There's less or fewer internal conversations to have. You can just kind of send a box of, of go faster parts or whatever it is. Um, you might also find that sponsors can be useful for supplying specialist facilities to help at different stages of the competition, uh, be that manufacturing or even sometimes testing. And that's also kind of linked to the um, subsystem requirements and specifications that we've talked about previously. So if your interest is clear in carbon fiber and the mass of the of the car is shown to be very important in your simulations, then you might be brave enough to take on a composite monocoque. But at that stage, it's probably a good idea to have some external specialists lined up to help you if you don't have the knowledge in, inside the team. So you can have sponsors that are helping it in that sense as well. So once you've identified which subsystems you need, you need um, some of them will be easier to buy and some will be easier to make. And sometimes it's unavoidable um, that you're going to need some external assistance. Having said that the sponsors can be really useful for giving you some external assistance, it's important as well to manage the risk of the program where you're relying on that. So if you have a, comp, uh, a sponsor that, of the team which is going to do your composite monocoque, and the monocoque is what you need to be able to start building the rest of the car, they're almost essential in terms of getting the whole program off the ground. And you, you almost can't work on other bits until they've done their part. So at that point, be proactive, talk to the sponsors, send them newsletters, invite them into your build area, let them meet the team, show them designs, keep them engaged, keep them proactive, keep them happy, because that's really important to make sure that they don't turn around when times are tough in their business and leave you behind. It's really important to do that, really important. It's also as well, you've got to be honest with yourselves. If you have you designed a car which is going to be difficult to produce or could you do it yourself? That's really important as well. Think about the overall team's aims, where you sat on the design, build, race triangle, where whereabouts do you want to be? But it's very important to think along those lines. If you've designed something which is difficult to manufacture, you could put a lot more risk into your, into your program than is otherwise the case. Having said all that, let's talk about now how we would execute an, an, uh, our project and build the car. So leadership is something that I think every CV for every student I've ever read who's done former student says they're a great leader, good leadership skills from doing former student. Um, although you might have different subsystems and different groups in your team, it's important to have a clear leader of the program. You need to have someone who's an overall charge. Um, this person it might be like a team principal or a technical director, but they've often got a really important role in managing external relationships so they're working with the former student events they're working with the university they're working with sponsors suppliers sometimes even other teams but it's important to have somebody that's in overall charge of the team it's not an easy job to do and you don't have to always agree with the decision of your of your team leader uh, clearly it's unfeasible to imagine a situation where everything the team leader says is is uh, exactly lined with their own views that's just not Realistically, that's not a human's work. But it's important to accept that decision. If you're going to have a leader, you have to let them lead. Um, a good leader, and if you've got a good, a large enough team, will delegate some responsibilities to other areas in the team. There's not going to be the case that they are some all-knowing super being that runs the whole thing and makes every single decision. They should delegate some decisions to other areas of the team. If your team is big, if you're lucky to have a big team, then you probably want to set up some sub teams and subcommittees to look after different areas of the car or different functions. Maybe there's a simulation group, maybe there's a suspension design group, maybe there's a manufacturing group. Um, 
don't expect as well, and, and this is kind of for somebody that's, that's led teams before, don't expect that your team leader will be absolutely perfect from day one. They're having to learn their role in the same way that you as students are learning to be engineers and learning to be um, a, a team. Give them time to learn the role and they're going to be, a, they're a human, I hope. They're going to make mistakes, except they're going to make mistakes and don't hold them up on it all the time. Everybody makes them and as the team leader, you're not immune from that. So the diagram here is showing uh, the evolution of the organization through time. I took this example from, from, from last year. Um, at the beginning on the left-hand side of the graph, you're starting very much as an engineering design office. So the engineering design function is maybe 80% of your time. You're doing a small amount of manufacturing and actually race team activities are almost zero. You've got a small amount perhaps in terms of planning. Um, but more or less your whole team is working like an engineering design office. You're reviewing designs, you're debating the validity, you're checking the designs, checking your subsystems, uh, and you're not really doing much else. Maybe you're doing some sort of small prototype manufacturing. As the program moves on, so sort of two or three months in, um, you're starting to ramp down that level of engineering design and you're focusing more on the manufacturing of the car. You're still not doing much in the way of racing activities, but you're constructing on the, constructing your car in stages, working different sub-assemblies, testing them, bringing them together, and trying to produce a car in a good time before the event. At the very end of the program, the last few months, you're starting to switch over now, and racing and testing side of our business is taking over. So at this point, uh, you're working on uh, some of the sub-assembly building, you might be doing some um, some functional testing on, on some of the subcomponents you've produced. You might also find that the engineering design starts to ramp back up again. So having done lots of design at the beginning and then a minimal amount while the construction is happening, you might find as you're starting to do more testing that actually there's a bit more engineering design comes in as you're reacting to faults and problems and challenges with your design, things that maybe you didn't anticipate at the beginning. One of the things that uh, is kind of linked to what we've just talked about in terms of leadership is that the racing side of, of, of the operation, when you get towards competitions, time is even more pressured than it is in the rest of the competition. You have to be decisive uh, and you have to have a clear leader at that point. Um, some good examples here. If you're in, in a country where you can't guarantee the weather, I mean, I'm in the UK, it's almost certain to be raining later on, even though it's dry now. Um, if you have a condition where the track is wet and maybe dry, maybe wet, you're not really sure, you can't spend all day waiting to see if the track will dry. You've perhaps got to go and set a lap time anyway, knowing that maybe things aren't perfect. So you need that clear leadership. You don't necessarily have a, 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 the luxury of debating things for hours on end. There's also the case that when you're running the car, there's probably a large number of routine checks and tasks that need to be uh, carried out so you need to check there's fuel in the car you need to check there's coolant in the car you need to check there's oil in it you need to check the tire pressures you need to check the bolts and the suspension are done up you need to check the driver's belts are done up before he goes out there's a whole load of fairly routine things that need to be checked and it's important to have um, checklists and, and, and a good organizational structure to make that happen as you're running through the project clearly you're not going to keep on time at all times, but keeping to some schedule is really, really important. Um, we've talked about uh, how, how the organization of the team has to change and the focus is changing through time. Um, if you don't keep to it, then, then that time transition is changing and you're not perhaps leaving enough time for testing. You don't have enough time to ramp up the race team aspect. You don't have enough time to practice working like a race team. You just turn over the competition, still in manufacturing mode, for example. So don't underestimate the importance of each phase of the program. Um, clearly, leaving time for testing and driver familiarity in the car is something which I think every person that's ever lectured on former student has probably said before. So I'm not going to spend my time <laughs> reiterating the importance of that now, but it is important to leave some time for the driver to get the best out of the car. When you're doing your plans, try and plan as well to be flexible. It's certainly better to be flexible with the plan than being too rigid. So give yourself some time to reflect on designs, to change them and to adapt. 
Likewise in manufacturing, don't plan to finish and then the very next day put it on the car. Identify some time to come back and think about it. Put some contingency into the plan because it's inevitable that will happen. It's impossible to plan for every eventuality. You can't possibly um, anticipate if a team member has to leave or, or a sponsor pulls out for, for some force majeure or as we've seen in the last couple of years, let's say there's a global pandemic and that shuts things down for a while. You can't plan for every eventuality, but if you plan to have some flexibility into your program, then that's going to help you in the longer term as well. Risk management is a, is a, I mean, we could talk about risk management for hours and then just on its own, but it's certainly worth touching upon in this context. So you can manage a technical risk to some degree by trying to minimize it in your designs. Um, this is the picture here is, is the test bed at our university back in 2006 as we found it, or rather as we left it with an engine on in place. As we found this, there was no engine. They'd taken it off at the last minute and it was just wires and cables dangling everywhere, a complete mess. Um, there wasn't much knowledge transfer, so I, we understood which engine was on there previously, but there was no wiring diagram for the test cell, nothing along those lines. So almost the first thing we had to do, because it was important to us to achieve our 90 horsepower target, was to go away and completely rewire and re-engineer the dynamometer. Ask yourself the question when you're looking at risk management, what you do if certain things happen. So the obvious one that we've kind of talked about already is for sponsors. If a sponsor, a key sponsor, withdraws that support, what do you do? If you can't compensate for that, then as we've said, be proactive, engage with them, try and keep them buying into your team. But is there a backup plan for, for, for if they leave? Um, you know, if you have, to use our example from earlier on, if you're making a composite monocoque and you've got an external sponsor that's helping you, if they pull out, what do you do? Do you take it on yourself? Can you take it on yourself? At what point do you say, okay, we need to go and buy steel tubing and start producing our own chassis? What is your backup? How long will it take you? It's worth planning that out. Okay, you might not have the ultimate performance of the car. It might not be quite what you wanted. Maybe it's not so... Uh, highly motivating to work on a tubular steel frame, but if you can't make a carbon frame, at some point you have to drop that uh, drop that program, um, and that risk management plan the alternatives where, where you can and where it's necessary. And that's linked as well. It's not written here, but it's very much linked to time. So you've probably got if your sponsor that's helping you on your carbon monocoque, if they pull out, you've probably got a certain period of time where you could find another one, depending on where you are in the project. But that window is pretty short and pretty fixed in length. If you can't find another sponsor to take over within a month, maybe, let's say, you've got to go and design something else. Think as well about the risk management of individuals. So we talked about the rule of seven. I think I've kind of hammered that point home enough. But think about what you do if a key team member has to leave for some reason. Now, I think the last couple of years have shown us that you can never tell when somebody might have to go. Uh, and do some isolation period because of an illness or they have to go to hospital or whatever. But could you cover for the absence of a key team member? Let's say that there's somebody who has all the knowledge of engine tuning and the engine's really important to your team. How do you make sure that that knowledge is sort of kept within the team and that if, they, if that person leaves or maybe they're struggling with their studies, they have to do more studying and can spend less time, less time working on the former student team, how do you how do you try and cover for that absence? How do you stop that affecting what it is you're doing in, on the pro on the program? Could you switch team members around, for example? So could you take somebody from another area and deputise for that person? Could you have a second colleague working alongside them to sort of mentor them to share that knowledge? How do you do that? But that's important, not just in former student teams, but I think in all businesses. Um, but it's really important. Uh, particularly if you've got a tight time situation like former student, how do you um, prevent that affecting your overall program? Okay, having gone through the whole program, so we've set some targets, we've set some functional requirements, we've done some assessments of sensitivity, we've built the car, how do you go away and validate it? How do you check that having gone through all these potential minefields, you've got to the end and you've got something which is a validated component? 
So I guess this is the most obvious thing I'm going to say all day, but validation is a very important as part of your program and reliability is crucial. So if you're a lucky team, you might go to a number of different events, but some teams, most teams will go to one event. You've got one shot at the endurance event, for example. So you've got to be reliable. You've got to confirm the car works and you should be, or should certainly plan to be in a situation when you go to your event that you know your car works and it will complete all of the events of which you're entering. One of the things that, that students say to, to us as design judges um, is that we want our car to be reliable. The obvious question to that is, okay, what have you done to make your car reliable? Do you understand what it is that causes unreliability in Formula Student? Just making the car a bit heavier because you weren't sure what the load case is doesn't necessarily make it more reliable. What is it? Why do cars break down? As we've said, you might only go to one competition. Minimizing the risk during that competition is therefore important because uh, um, you don't want to be trialing brand new things for the first time, let's say, in the endurance. And the validation can help you minimize that risk. Validation is also really important, probably for teams that follow yours. So it helps you and helps validate what you did. But if your validation comes through that maybe your simulations weren't correct, you're maybe a bit late in the program because you're not going to design a whole new car when you've only got a week to the competition. But you can make sure that the teams following you are not going to make the same mistakes as you've made. So setting that legacy is, is really important. So validation can exist at different levels. Um, during the prototyping and pre-production stage, you can check, you can manufacture what you've designed. So if you've got a, some way of interesting way, for example, of designing the a tubular frame or a composite monocoque, then you can look at different test pieces to check what it is that you have to produce and how you can produce. You can check the technology before you go and build the full chassis. I would hope that, for example, the first time you try and weld two steel tubes together is not when you've got a whole chassis jigged and tacked ready to go. I would hope that you would have practiced on some tubes, different thickness, or different angles, different um, different different sorts of materials to practice on the welding and practice on the on the on the production. And the same is true of the composite monocoque. Try laminating some little test pieces of inserts and with some core in them, at different shapes, and check that you can actually produce them and and uh, you can make little little samples rather than just try making a whole chassis as the first thing. Uh, some of the homologation requirements for the side impact or side equivalent structure equivalency sections or the impact attenuator can be quite good here as well as ways of checking your manufacturing and validating your manufacturing process. The other example I think of here is if you were um, something like Boeing or Airbus, you're producing a passenger aircraft you would do some checks on that before you filled it with people and try to fly across an ocean. You're going to have, have some confidence that, the, that your vehicle, your product is good. And you're not going to start by just trying to produce an entire wing or an entire fuselage in one go. You're going to make smaller panels and, and, and check your methods. You can also then validate completed parts, of course. So uh, anything where you've got uh, a bonded joint, uh, Clearly, there's some advantage there to validating those. So um, a lot of teams are using tubular suspension with um, carbon fiber rods and metal and fittings that bond in the ends. Uh, check the reliability of those. Don't just check a one off as a test piece, but maybe try and check every single one. You know, I hope from your calculations, what the what the strength requirement needs to be for each suspension member. So you should be able to check that each time you glue one, it comes to that same level of strength. Likewise, if you've got a push rod suspension, or as you can see on this car, all sorts of different rods to hold up wings, then check that those rods are, uh, 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 don't buckle. They're not eccentric. Check that it does fulfill the criteria before you bolt it to the car. Try and be as confident as you can be for everything you bolt to your car, everything you fix to your car, fulfills its individual purpose. You do then have the ability to do some subsystem validation, which is kind of the third level of, of, of validation you can do. So at this point, you're focusing on the key targets here. This is really important. So if 
you did your sensitivity sweeps and it said that the chassis torsional stiffness, for example, was really important to the overall car performance, then you should spend the time checking that. Did you achieve your target? If your chassis uh, torsional stiffness uh, doesn't matter in simulation, let's say that it doesn't matter what the stiffness is, you can have a range of values and it shows no sensitivity. Okay, maybe the simulation is wrong, but if the simulation was correct, don't perhaps spend the time doing a load of validation on that. You may wish to do some checks as part of your simulations and to validate the way you simulated it, but you maybe don't need to spend weeks and weeks and weeks doing different measurements and checks and seeing what happens if you change suspension stiffness or, or different dampers, for example. Um, focus on what's important. Focus on what your key targets were and how you validate whether you've checked, uh, whether you've achieved those. Likewise, if horsepower was really important to your team, then spend the time checking the engine, checking the test beds, do lots of test bed work to make sure that you can get that horsepower. Um, work as well if you can on things like transient performance. If if you're showing that the that the engine needs to be tractable and through different gears, then automatic gear shifting systems can be useful, and you can validate those before you um, go straight into into testing. That does bring us on quite nicely to vehicle testing. So I hope this is obvious again, but uh, the whole vehicle testing should be used as a validation for your lap time simulations as well as for driver training, but it only really works if you test the car on the circuits you've simulated, or to put it another way, simulate the circuits you're going to test on. The two have to be the same. There's no point in validating a load of, or uh, running a load of simulations on the skid pad, and then only testing acceleration as kind of an extreme example. It's really important that you're validating and you're simulating the same things. Uh, when you're doing your vehicle testing, a certain amount of the time is just spent driving around circuits as fast as you can. But there are other tests that you will need to perform to make sure that you're getting the most out of your, your car. At this point, it's back to sort of the magic owing number and being more than the sum of the parts. So think about how you tune your electronic systems like launch control systems. How do you control the transients of your combustion engine? So you, you see a lot of teams that the engine runs beautifully at a standard throttle and a fixed speed. If you blip the throttle, then the transient ignition control is not good enough to stop the um, stop the engine from dying when, when the revs drop again. Um, when you're working uh, at a test, try and work the same as you would in a competition. So have somebody whose job it is to check the fluids. Somebody will check the tire pressure. Somebody will help the driver get strapped in. Start to build and, and work like a race team right from the day one of testing. Uh, there are a certain amount of driver testing days which really have to focus on the driver as well. So uh, I used to say the driver is important because without the driver, the tar, car doesn't go anywhere. Maybe in the world of driverless, former student, uh, that, that perhaps isn't quite as true as it used to be. But I guess you still need to train your autonomous driver. Um, but practice doing different things like you would in the competition. So practice autocross with cold tires straight out of the box because when you do the first autocross, you won't have hot tires. So practice cold. Practice following other cars on circuit. If you're lucky enough to come from university where you've got other cars available, practice driving with other cars because when you come to endurance and when you come to autocross, other cars will be there. Get used to communicating with your driver as well during the testing phase by using marshalling signals and communication. Practice like you would talk to him or her at the event. Okay, I think I've probably uh, lectured you enough on resources and requirements. I, I hope that's been uh, interesting. Um, I, I guess we have a little bit of time for any questions, or or maybe even afterwards, you can you can send some stuff through. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions? Okay, uh, no questions from the students, but I have uh, one question from my side. Uh, how do you think how much time uh, teams should uh, spend uh, on track testing prior to the event? So I think it's a, it's a bit of a balance, clearly. Um, 
I would say that you probably want three weeks is a good amount of testing. I think beyond that, you start to wear your car out maybe. Um, but three weeks is enough. You can spend a week uh, setting the car up properly, understanding how you should do your transient control, different things. A week of driver familiarization and then sort of a week of working on setups and trying different conditions. Um, I think that's kind of a fairly sensible target. And I'm kind of also, I also like to recommend three weeks knowing that that perhaps for different reasons teams might then only achieve a two weeks but i i think two or three weeks is the sort of time uh, an ideal time to aim for um but as i said it's really important to make the most of those you know start working like a race team so if, if the team have uh, a huge amount of the testing they uh, should uh, also manage uh, the parts where so they have the spare parts and so on and so on. It's also important. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's um, something that maybe is a sign that your team has been successful to some degree. If you're if you're doing so much testing and reliability that parts are, uh, are starting to wear out, um, then then yeah, it's um, it's probably a, a good sign in some respects. It's also worth because of this. It's also worth having a plan to do more detailed checks on the car. So you're doing some testing. Uh, and you've done a testing day and it's sort of high fives all around and the driver's very happy. Uh, other than checking things like tire pressures and, and, the, and the suspension maybe, um, start taking the car apart a bit more and just checking there's no hidden gremlins there, things that will cause unreliability going forward. Um, even simple things like, you know, some hose clips are done up to the cracked level, not too tight, not too loose. Um, but try and look for any clues that you see in, in the car. You know, I'm not saying take the whole thing back apart, but 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 really try and check every system to check there's nothing that's that's going to cause you some unreliability or something which is wearing unrealistically. I remember talking to a team from from Toronto, I think it was a number of years ago, and they had a very defined service schedule. So they knew exactly what it was they needed to change at what intervals. They're using aluminium for the uh, housings of their CV joints, for example, and they were hard anodized, but they knew that every 300 kilometers they had to change them. And they had this schedule and there was the same thing for other parts as well. Impressive. <laughs> yeah, I was, it was much better than anything I was doing at the time, put it that way. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, reliability, uh, can you name maybe top five uh, problems, which is uh, see, common to many teams in which uh, subsystems yeah, of course. Yeah. So um, I still want to name an exact top five, but uh, you have some teams that run out of fuel or energy, uh, which uh, as silly as it sounds is, is still a thing. You know, it's important to check that you can pick up not only that your fuel consumption in terms of liters per minute is something sensible, but also that you can use all your tank. So, you know, try running it almost out of fuel, try running your car with almost no fuel in it to check that you, when you're doing high dynamic performance that you don't, um, that you don't, uh, you can get to all your fuel, you don't leave some in the tank. Uh, suspension durability is another one. So uh, if your testing area is very flat and very smooth with rough tarmac, then perhaps the suspension loading is not as high as it would be if you're on a very hot day at Hockenheim Ring in Germany on some very sticky tarmac with some bumps on the track. Sometimes you see situations there where the driver's really in the groove and, 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 and you put much higher loads through the car. So you can do things to check that maybe by looking at strain gauges in suspension and other things. So, so that durability is important. Um, what else is there? So uh, driver fatigue is another side of things. So uh, make sure that the driver can drive for the full 20 minutes that he, he or she would do. Uh, during the endurance, that, that's, that's a cause of reliability. Drivers losing confidence or losing concentration, making mistakes. Um, there's a certain amount of unreliability, unreliability that's caused by um, what I think I might term finger trouble. So the car not being quite completely bolted together properly. Um, you get examples where the exhaust falls apart and, and the car is too noisy and gets black flagged. You get leaks from oil systems, you get leaks from the coolant, and these things are all items that are going to, um, to cause some reliability. And 
the way to try and mitigate that perhaps is to have a checklist so every time the car is going out there's somebody's responsibility to check different areas of the car you can try and minimize this but sometimes there's there's just no substitute for, for putting mileage on the car um, but yeah i think those are the kind of the main things that we see uh, see see most Uh, hello. Uh, uh, during the dynamic test, it's uh, better to calculate the track by second, uh, or it's better to plan uh, an approximate uh, pace and continue to really on the pilot. So, just so I understand, that, I was talking here about um, how how to. I'm not sure I really understand the question, sorry. Во время динамических испытаний лучше просчитывать трек посекундно или же лучше наметить примерный план и полагаться на пилота уже? А как за посекунду лучше просчитать? Ну, грубо говоря, не посекундно, а по поворотам, по разгону динамики. Не посекундно. Mm -hmm. Okay, the, uh, in general, the question was about how the race engineer uh, should work with the driver in terms of the um, uh, pace on track. Uh, set the lap time target or uh, split to a different section and uh, trying to communicate uh, and to give some feedback to them in terms of lap time and uh, rely on the driver or okay, some I understand. exactly yeah, I understand. feedback. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, that's something we haven't really touched upon, actually. And that, that's a really important point, because um, at least one person in your team is going to have to be a driver, but somebody else is going to have to be the race engineer. So, some of this comes from experience of testing and running some endurance events, but it's certainly true that in the first half of the endurance, for example, uh, it's good to have an ideal sort of lap time in mind, um, based on what the competition is doing and what you think the car can do. But uh, it's important as well not to use up all the tire life in the first half of the endurance. So having your first driver that drives like an absolute crazy person as flat out as he possibly can in the first half of the endurance uh, really isn't the, the best solution. So at this point, I think I'm tying my driver to be slightly more conservative. Uh, yes, it's important to set, set some quick times. And you kind of have a feel for what sort of times you might need based on what other teams have done. Because if you're, um, let, let's hope that you've designed a successful car and you're running towards the end of the event, you, you've seen what, other, what lap times other cars are doing, so you roughly know what, what you need to be achieving. Um, uh, and it is a race, you know, so it is important to keep the driver pushing, but he has to, or he or she has to be controlled enough to know not to push the car too hard in the first half of the endurance, because you need to leave something for, for, the, for, the, um, for, the, for the second driver. I think you have to have the understanding built up through testing. So in testing, run it like you would a proper endurance, have a two minute driver change, have the flags, have some passing zones, every so often wave the driver through different areas of the passing zones, get the driver familiar with how the car feels and get the two drivers in the endurance talking to each other. So at the end of the endurance, have the second driver talk to the first driver to understand, okay, well, how was the car when I got into it? what did you leave it like um and these kind of things i think it's important to build that relationship sometimes um if you've got two or three good drivers you can use their different strengths with each other and you can kind of get some multiplying effect where where the combined learning is better than individual learning not sure if that really answers the question i hope it gives some kind of insight though mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, thanks for so answer. Okay. One more question. Hello. 
Mr. Kals, uh, I am Vladislav Ivanov from NCM, uh, North Capital Motorsport Racing Team from uh, St. Petersburg. And uh, we have previously discussed during this event that the main goal behind the formal student project is uh, the development of qualified engineers. And uh, it, is, it is the main aim for us. And uh, they are not racers, they are future engineers. And what do you think uh, should we aim for? To become a racing team or to become an engineering team? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a really good question. So yeah, I mean, clearly, um, the the skills that you learn in becoming a successful racing team will also help you to become a successful engineer in the future that that's clearly true then the two are not entirely separate in my view uh but it's only the case that that's true if you understand exactly why you've done things and what was important in your success so yeah it's great to win a trophy maybe at the end of the competition but it's important to understand what it was about your engineering and about your design and about your teamwork and your performance that allowed you to get there. Uh, so, so yeah, it's certainly true that um, that it's uh, it's all about becoming a good engineer or a good team worker or a good uh, a good qualified professional at the end of it all. Um, but um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't focus on the success because if you're a good engineer or a good uh, a good team member, then you can achieve success anyway. No, it should be the case. Maybe it's not always, but it should be the case that the competition is won by the best engineers because they're the ones that uh, understood the, the project uh, best and did the best job of producing a, a Formula racing car. Uh, and you uh, mentioned that uh, diagram of design, build and race. So uh, does that mean that uh, the good team uh, have to get the best out of uh, each of that components and not focus on a uh, particular one? Yeah, I think so. And, and I think your, your team should be able, in the ideal world, to move around that diagram. So in certain parts of the competition, early on you're going to spend a lot of time focusing on the design but you you have to not forget about the building and the racing side of things likewise when you're doing the building you have to not forget what was important in the design and also then how you'll use that as a race team and when you're in the racing side of things you have to really understand what was you designed what you did and what you're testing and validating and the limitations of the manufacturing and everything else so um so yeah you, you kind of need to be a good balance but also be able to move around that diagram at the same time um, thank you for uh, answers and thank you for your time. Yeah, no worries. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, Owen. Uh, my name is Vladimir. I am from Taliesi Racing Team from Taliesi. Uh, and uh, my question uh what about motivation uh why they uh motivation for students why they uh, have to stay in a project uh how to motivate uh, them how to motivate uh, new team members uh to uh to to get in work yeah okay that's a really interesting question so i think um for some people the motivation uh it doesn't almost matter because they're so have this internal drive to be part of of the project in which case it doesn't really matter too much uh i think it's important that every team member can understand how they've contributed to the final product i think that's really important so if i was a team member i'd like to be able to point to the car and say this has my thoughts or my understanding or my knowledge or my skill or my experience or expertise on it I think it's important to have that quite clearly defined. It's also important probably, and this sounds obvious, so I don't mean it to be maybe, but it's important to ask the, the, the student or, or the team member what it is they want to get from the project. 
some some team members would like to use the former student project to learn how to do a certain activity let's say maybe they've joined the former student team because they want to learn how to do composite layups in which case then getting them doing composite layups is really the best way of motivating them and playing to the skills of that individual i think one of the challenges as well is uh how you maintain that motivation through time so you might start off with a team which has a very high motivation to do uh, a former student car but maybe as time goes by, then, um, then the project is more challenging uh, because of diff different different things, maybe time pressure or financial pressure. At this point, it's important to have some kind of like timeout sessions as well. So have some time away from the project and then come back to it. And university um, exams and coursework is a good time to have these splits, for example. So that helps maintain the motivation by having a little bit of time away from the project as well. But it's important, I think, honestly, to understand what every team member wants from the project because it's it's not always the same. Uh, it's okay, but uh, teams uh, really small, and uh, when uh, older uh, members, uh, uh, not so big uh, quantity, and uh, uh, it's. Uh, uh, new members uh, or from student team? Uh, uh, and, and it's new members. From student team. Ah, okay. Uh, new members come to the team. Uh, they are young. They don't understand uh, uh, which uh, general goals uh, in this project. And uh, they uh, don't want to work a lot. Uh, they don't understand uh, uh, how many uh, experience, how many uh, uh, how many useful things uh, they uh, get in this project. Uh, uh how many emotions uh, and uh, we can uh, uh, our team can't uh, um, can't make a normal team can't make a big team which uh, uh, will uh, building a new car uh, and uh, uh, all works um uh, uh, made uh, about four, three people, and uh, when they go out uh, from the team, uh, uh, there are about uh, three, two people who can. Uh, do the work properly. And uh, it's uh, not uh, not good. Mm. Yeah, I understand what you mean. It, it's tricky, isn't it? Because you might have a really motivated and determined group of students that do a good job, but they all leave, and then maybe the enthusiasm for the for the for the new students isn't quite there. So um, different things that that I've seen tried in the past. So you you can have like um, mentoring side side of, uh, of 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 the competition so if you have younger engineers come in have them team up with a more more experienced former student engineer and work with them um, sometimes if you have a, a small group of of younger engineers it's good to be able to give them a subsystem of the car so something that, that we tried years ago was having um the the, the students do uh, the, the younger students do the pedal box of the car. So they design the brake pedal, the throttle pedal, the assembly of the master cylinders and everything together in the car. So they had that as a clearly identifiable part of the car. Um, and also it, it's important um, and sometimes quite difficult. So maybe it doesn't always happen, but it's important for the more experienced engineers to sort of let go of the project a little bit, allow the newer students in, but also allow them to make some mistakes. It's entirely natural that as you bring newer students in, 
there's going to be some 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 cyclic variation in the quality of the car as the new students come in and make some of the same mistakes perhaps that, that the older students have made um and that's that's fine and that's just kind of how how the competition is um but it's important to if you want new students to come in to also allow them to to have some ownership of, of and transfer some ownership of the car okay thank you thank you very much